Harvey Robinson is thought to be one of the youngest serial killers in American history. He was only 17 years old when he murdered three women in Allentown, Pennsylvania in the early 1990s. He remains on death row. This is his story. December 17, 1974, Harvey Robinson was born in Allentown, Pennsylvania. Robinson's father, Harvey Rodriguez Robinson, was an alcoholic jazz musician who physically and emotionally abused Robinson's mother. When Robinson was three, his father left home and was later incarcerated for beating his mistress to death. Police arrested Robinson for the first time when he was only nine years old. In school, he showed signs of severe conduct disorder, and teachers quickly noted Robinson's inability to tell right from wrong and his severe distaste for authority. At an early age, Harvey Robinson showed great athletic and academic potential. He won awards for his essays and was a fierce competitor in wrestling, soccer, football, and cross country. Then somewhere along the way, something went horribly wrong. At 12.35 a.m. on August 5, 1992, Robinson burglarized the home of Joan Burghardt, 29, who lived alone in a one-bedroom apartment on the first floor of a residential apartment complex on the east side of Allentown. He broke through the screen on the patio door, which was locked, and ripped just enough to slip his hand through. Burghardt reported the burglary and the missing $50 from the drawer in her bedroom dresser. Everything else seemed undisturbed. Four days later, around 11.30 a.m. on August 9, 1992, Burkhardt's neighbor telephoned the police to complain that Burkhardt's stereo had been on for three days and nights and that no one answered the doorbell. She also reported that the screen had been out of the window for three nights and during one of those nights, she heard Burkhardt screaming and banging on the wall and sounds like she was being beaten up. When the police arrived, they found Burkhart dead, lying on the living room floor. She had been severely beaten about the head. The autopsy revealed that Burkhart had been sexually assaulted and hit over the head at least 37 times, fracturing her skull and damaging her brain. She also had defensive injuries on both hands, indicating she was alive during at least some of the attack. Seminal stains were found on a pair of shorts found at the scene, suggesting that a male had masturbated on them. Charlotte Smoyer was always diligent about delivering the morning call newspaper on her assigned route on the east side of Allentown. When she failed to deliver the paper on the morning of June 9th, one of her customers became concerned. She did not spot Smoyer, but what she did see alarmed her enough to phone the police. Smoyer's newspaper cart was left unattended for more than 30 minutes in front of her neighbor's house. When the police arrived, they found the newspaper cart half filled with newspapers and Schmoyer's radio and the headset had been strewn on the ground between the two houses. There were also finger streaks on the window pane of the door of a nearby garage of one of the houses. Based on the scene, the police concluded that Schmoyer had most likely been abducted. The police began their search and found her bicycle abandoned along with some of her personal property. Within hours, a tip came in and investigators began searching a wooded area where they found blood, a shoe, and the body of Charlotte Smoyer buried under a stack of logs. According to the autopsy report, Smoyer was stabbed 22 times and her throat was slashed. 
Also, there were cutting and scraping wounds in her neck area, indicating they were inflicted while Schmoyer was still conscious and her neck bent down. She had also been raped. Investigators were able to collect blood samples, a pubic hair, and a head hair on Schmoyer that did not match her blood and hair. The evidence was later matched to Robinson through DNA. John and Denise Sam Callie lived on the east side of Allentown, not far from where Smoyer had been abducted. On June 17, 1993, Robinson burglarized their home while the couple was away for a few days. He had taken John's gun collection, which was kept in a bag in the closet. Within days, John bought three new guns, one of which he purchased for Denise for protection. The couple grew even more concerned about their safety after learning that someone had broken into their neighbor's home and attacked their child. On June 20th, 1993, Robinson entered a woman's home and choked and raped her five-year-old daughter. The child managed to live, but based on her injuries, it appeared that he had intended for her to die. Some theorized that he was actually after the child's mother, but when he found her sleeping with her partner, he attacked the child instead. On June 28, 1993, Denise Sam Callie was alone as her husband was out of town. She awoke to the sounds that Robinson was making from inside the walk-in closet near her bedroom. Frightened, she decided to try to run out of the house, but he grabbed her. They struggled. She managed to get out of the house, but Robinson grabbed her again and pinned her down onto the ground in the front yard. Robinson reportedly punched her, sliced her lip open, and then raped her. As the two fought, she was able to bite him on the inside of the arm. Her screams alerted a neighbor who turned on their porch light, which caused Robinson to flee. When the police arrived, they found Denise alive, but severely beaten with strangulation marks around her neck and her lip deeply slashed. They also found a butcher knife wrapped in a napkin laying outside the bathroom door. A month after killing Charlotte Smoyer, Robinson would break into the home of 47-year-old grandmother Jessica Jean Fortney. He sexually assaulted her and strangled her to death. Denise Sam Callie, Robinson's fourth victim, would finally lead to his capture. She escaped Robinson's initial attack and agreed to allow the police to use her as bait. When Robinson returned to Sam Callie's home several nights later to presumably finish off the job, an officer was there to meet him. Robinson, who broke in through the window, and the officer exchanged gunfire before he fled the scene, crashing through a glass window. After the shootout, police apprehended Robinson at a local hospital where he'd gone to seek treatment for his wounds. Though Robinson was a juvenile offender, he did not receive a more lenient sentence due to his age. The grisly nature, repetition, and speed of these crimes sparked enough community outrage and the fact that Robinson was linked by all three murders by DNA evidence. He received three consecutive death sentences and more than 100 years in prison. Over the years, however, Harvey Robinson has filed taxpayer-funded appeal after appeal, namely following the 2012 U.S. Supreme Court decision that deemed death sentences for juveniles unconstitutional and has succeeded in overturning two of his death sentences. <laughs>